you know bytecode signatures, it's uh, Boolean, right? So it knows that I'm going to load the Boolean class from that LDC. Um, the second example I have here has the name of Pi, and it's from a bootstrap method I wrote, but it means that somebody reading this code can make a fairly quick determination that this is meant to return um, you know, a, a floating point uh, Pi value. It just makes life easier for anybody who has to debug your bytecode. All right, so there are some practices that we can use. What about some pitfalls? Um, one thing with Condi is you can't use a direct cycle. Um, if you try to have a constant dynamic that uses itself in its own bootstrap, you will get a stack overflow exception. Um, and that's by spec. Now, if for some reason you wanted to do something like that, you can use um, indirect uh, cyclical re resolution. Um, so as long as you invoke some method or do something else that invokes the same, um, the same constant dynamic again, that you can do. Again, you'll stack overflow eventually unless you've written some kind of code to take care of that case. It's surprising how often people do this by accident. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of is that constant pool entries have the same life cycle as the class, which means they only get unloaded when the class loader gets unloaded. So if you have references to objects um, from other class loaders in your constant dynamic, you have effectively tied the life cycles of those two class loaders together. Um, so you know if you have added things to the bootstrap path um, and they get loaded by the bootloader, it's probably a bad idea to use condies to code that's in other loaders because they're going to become permanently there. Um, and then Condi resolution is very similar to class initialization. You're going to run into the same kinds of uh, issues there that you run into with class initialization. All right. So what can we do with Condi, and, and where might this start showing up? Uh, the first example is non-capturing lambdas. There's no reason that they have to continue to be uh, invoke dynamics. They can be Condied and become shared states so that I only have to resolve them once. So it means you know a slight uh, performance win because you've resolved it once, you don't have to resolve it on every invocation. Um, there was talk that this was going to make 12, but when I checked the other day, um, I haven't seen it, and David is shaking his head no. So that's a good confirmation that it's unlikely to make 12, but uh, something that's likely to show up in the future. Uh, so how many people have had to write this kind of code to work around bootstrapping problems, this initialization on demand holder pattern? Yeah. It's a pain to write this code. Well, it's not really painful to write the code, but it's annoying that you have to. Um, and with the introduction of Condi, you can get this kind of lazy initialization without having to create the class. Now, you have to generate bytecode today to do that, but there is an answer in the future um, if you're interested in how you might be able to do this um, using Java code, take a look at JEP 303, which adds uh, intrinsics for LDC and for Invoke Dynamic. Um, it's not currently targeted to any release as far as I can tell, but uh, it's a really cool way to be able to uh, write Java code that generates uh, Indy or Condi. Okay, and then var handles. Uh, when var handles came out, the best practices that people talked about was always create them um, and store them in static finals so that they're you know a nice route to find them for the JIT and so that you don't have to create them all the time. This is great, except that it comes at a startup cost because you're doing a bunch of extra lookups to get these var handles um, when you're doing your class initialization. So it'd be really nice to be able to rebase these on Condi so you get that lazy initialization you want, and you get you know that the good constant semantics that you want. Um, and if you never use it, you never pay for the initialization. So you know as we get more and more of these things coming together, the performance and the way we can write code gets better. Right? So this goes back to what I said earlier about uh, timelines. We're getting pieces of functionality here and there, and uh, eventually it's all going to come together and, and give you a pretty nice story. So that's JDK 11. That gave us nestmates, which paid off some technical debt. 
made it easier to generate bytecode, and Condi, which makes it uh, more efficient to use constants that are dynamically computed. All right, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we'll take a look at JDK 12. JDK 12 hasn't shipped yet, but this is the current list of JEPs uh, as of yesterday, I believe I pulled this down. Um, and the one that we wanna take a look at is the JVM Constants API, or Constable, as it frequently gets called. All right, so the idea of Constable is that Java programs um, historically haven't had a way to talk to the symbolic information that's encoded in class files. They're only able to talk about the resolved values. Um, and so Constable says, how do we make that easier for Java programmers to talk to the symbolic info instead of the, the live value? So if we start by looking at our constant pool, right? Um, we've got a bunch of constants there, constant string, constant class, constant name and type, um, primitive constants as well. And they're all sort of symbolic information at the VM level, they're in your constant pool. And the VM knows how to uh, sort of load them up and give them to you uh, when it's required to. Right, and so the VM has to cache this somehow when you actually trigger resolution of it in some way. So you run your LDC bytecode, you run your invoke dynamic or your constant dynamic. These constants get created and they have to be stored somewhere so that the VM can give them back to you. So there's some kind of cache in the VM. Um, and it, typically it's object pointers for anything that's an object or you know it might just be the primitive value. And then because you've triggered resolution of this, somehow those values end up as things you can access and use in your program, right? So if we look at you know the Java heap or the Java user perspective of things, you've taken that symbolic information, you've moved it around this loop, and now you have the actual object, right? The VM cached a pointer to it, and can give you back whatever this object is. So you've got your string object or your method type or your or your primitive value. And right, the path seems to always go this way. We start with the symbolic, we go through resolution, and we give you the object value. Okay, that works, but what if what I really wanted was the symbolic information? There really isn't anything in Java that's set up to give you that symbolic information today. You can pull the pieces of it out uh, using reflection and, and build your own uh, abstractions around this, but that's not a great answer because it means that everybody has to sit down and build their own abstractions and they don't work together and they don't communicate. So looking at this, the answer was, how do we make it so you can talk about these things in a standardized way? And the class that was created is javalang constant, which is a new package for, uh, for this set of uh, constable related APIs. And the class that, the, or the root of this is constant descriptor or constant desk. Um, and so for each of the constant pool types, there is a constant descriptor uh, that corresponds to them. So for class, there's class descriptor. For method type, there's uh, method type descriptor. Um, and then there's a dynamic, a dynamic constant descriptor to handle uh, Condi. Um, but how do I get one of these things? Well, you can create one yourself, but the other way to do it is to look at which classes have been marked as constable. So constable classes are those that um, can be represented in the constant pool. So all of the ones that can be represented in the constant pool now implement an interface called constable, which has a single method that says describe constable. And you can call this on one of them and get back the constant you want, or the constant description. That's pretty cool. I mean, that closes our loop. We can go from the symbolic in the class file all the way around the loop, resolve it, end up with an object, and then we can get the constant description. Okay, that's cool for anything that you can actually describe and it's a big step forward because now we have a standard way of talking about um, symbolic information. But what if I want to go the other way? Well, at least at the heap level, I can take my constant description and I can resolve it and get back the actual live value. Uh, for a lot of things, this is trivial. You know, your string is a string regardless of where you resolve it. Um, for some other things though, you may need to have access permissions to be able to do that resolution. 
So that resolve constant description uh, method takes a method handles lookup object. So that resolution is done within the context of that method handles lookup object. Um, we'll probably see more and more of that uh, in Java going forward that you know the uh, method handles lookup becomes your capability object to determine whether you're allowed to do something. Uh, we're already seeing more of that with more and more APIs showing up in Java Lang Invoke. Um, so this is cool. What can I do with it? Well, the constant I haven't shown on this slide yet is uh, dynamic constants, right? Condi. So, you know, that's the one that's more interesting for a lot of people because it's how you get, you know, your var handles, your enums, your primitive types. Um, so we need to find some kind of relationship there. And this is the kind of code you would write if you wanted to create a dynamic con constant descriptor uh, yourself. So this is the descriptor for a condi. Um, this is particular one is using a known bootstrap method. Um, so rather than writing out all these constant descriptors longhand, um, there's a helper class called uh, constant descriptor or descript. I still haven't figured out the proper way to pronounce the constant descriptors, the short form of it. So uh, there is this helper class. It has an S on the end of its name, and it's got um, pre-built constants for you to describe the, uh, the bootstrap methods from constant bootstraps and a bunch of the common um, class descriptors you might want. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm creating a new dynamic constant descriptor that is going to use the bootstrap method for primitive classes. It's going to use uh, the name i, so it's going to give me back the int primitive class, and the type of it is going to be the constant descriptor class. So this is the Java level code to build a condi. Um, and then if I want to actually resolve this, I call that resolve constant descriptor and I pass it a method handle that's allowed, or a method handles lookup object that has all the right privileges to, to complete that resolution. And then out of that, I will get my int dot class. Um, this is pretty cool. Um, and note the relationship again between constant bootstraps and uh, constant descriptors, right? We're starting to build in uh, links between some of these constant classes so that the VM and uh, the language and even Java C are allowed to know about their behavior. Um, and to that end, I just want to point out one extra thing here, and that's that um, to build a constant descriptor, there's usually an of method, right? There's a bunch of static methods, you know, on class it might be of array or it might be uh, just of itself. So these are the ones you're going to look for if you're trying to write your own constant descriptors. Uh, but on dynamic uh, constant descriptor, there's a special one named of canonical. And this recognizes certain forms of um, those constant bootstrap methods and knows how to give you back um, whatever that constant descriptor would have resolved to. So it knows how to give you the constant descriptor for int dot class instead of giving you the one for the condi that would load in dot class. Um, it's a subtle thing, but it makes it a little easier to deal with this because you can talk about, oh, I know that's in dot class instead of, oh, I know that's a constant descriptor that's going to eventually give me in dot class. So we're baking some knowledge of these constant bootstraps into the APIs. Um, and that becomes interesting uh, in the context of JEP 303. All right, so there's a couple of future directions for this. One is the missing piece of the circle, right? Earlier I drew the circle that showed us going from symbolic through the resolved value um, up into the, the values you get on the heap and then finally all the way over to the constant descriptors. The piece that's missing is the piece that lets you go from the symbolic information in the VM to symbolic information right away without taking the path through the resolved values. Um, and there's work being done to look at how to do this. Uh, likely, it'll be new signatures for constant bootstraps and for invoke dynamic that'll let you get a you know set of um, constant descriptors. And the interesting thing about this is it means that you can start to encode things that are not resolvable into your bootstrap methods. So you can code 
you know, methods or classes or other things that you can't actually resolve because all you needed was the symbolic information because you're going to pass it around to somebody else. Um, that's one piece to be looking at. The future extension on that even is to then take a look at that and say, I'd really like that to be able to resolve back into the constant pool. And so there's um, investigation into how to make that work as well, that that resolution of constant descriptors that come from the constant pool will actually resolve the constant pool as well. Uh, which starts to become terrifying in the context of JVM TI. But <laughs> um, so the other path for this stuff that's a little more language level is JEP 303, which I mentioned earlier adds intrinsics for LDC and for invoke dynamic instructions. Um, the idea being that you can create up a tree of constant descriptors, and as long as all the things are constant enough and the Java C compiler can track that, um, then you get a way that you can encode uh, invoke dynamics and uh, LDCs directly in your Java code. You can write it, it ends up looking fairly ugly right now because it's a lot of code usually to get the operation you want. Um, but Java C can then see that and turn it into the, uh, the byte code that you actually wanted to get there. If you want to see a much longer presentation on how that works, Brian Getz gave a, a great talk about it at uh, the JVM Languages Summit last year called uh, Below the Fold. All right, so what have we gotten so far? We've got nestmates, which um, paid off some of the inner class's technical debt, made it a little easier to write bytecode. We got Condi, which made it easier to get dynamic constants to get them cheaper. And now 12 will bring Constable, which starts to give us ways to talk about symbolic information. Right? And so we see all these little building blocks that start to come together and uh, the payoff, especially for people who are using Java, uh, starts to get larger and larger as we uh, move down this path. All right, so that's it for me. Most of the code and, and things I've talked about today, you can um, check out on OpenJ9. I'm an uh, OpenJ9 guy, so I have to give the, the plug there. If you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can connect to me uh, through the OpenJ9 Slack or Twitter or, or any of those ways. Are there any questions? So once again, a little bit off topic, um, because I haven't been, well, reading a lot of OpenJ9. Can you just wrap this up in five sentences? What's the big difference to OpenJDK? Uh, what's so cool about it? Okay. So OpenJ9 is, um, it's IBM's JVM. So IBM has been using this JVM for all their products for years and years and years. Um, and it's got a different set of tuning constraints and a different set of trade-offs from Hotspot. And so when you run OpenJ9, you take OpenJDK, the class libraries, um, and you pull Hotspot out and you stick the OpenJ9 JVM in instead. And so you, the trade-offs you get there are the same stable APIs that you're used to running in Java, so all your Java code just works. Um, but you get OpenJ9's garbage collectors, OpenJ9's JITs. Um, and in particular, OpenJ9 is really good about memory usage. Um, so you'll find that we typically take about half the memory that Hotspot uses to give you the same throughput. Um, we have some other interesting things like uh, dynamic AOT code. So we have uh, something called a shared classes cache um, that's very easy to use. You just add one command line option. And any class loader that's a subclass of URL class loader is then eligible to uh, save its classes away in this cache uh, sort of automatically and for the JIT to save away some uh, compiled code so that your next run starts faster and gets up to speed better. Um, this is similar to, I believe, Hotspot's uh, class data sharing, but it's um, dynamic instead of done ahead of time. So, yep. Is there a way to use Condi for uh, uh, lazy uh, lazy initialization from Java today or not yet? Or not even just for var handles? Uh, not yet. Um, you really, you're going to have to wait for JEP 303.
or generate bytecode. Yep. Uh, going nestmates. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nestmates. Uh, what is the impact of the bytecode? Is it uh, generally will it be smaller? Generate the bytecode. Um, the impact on bytecode isn't that the bytecode is smaller. It's that you no longer have to worry about when you use invoke special versus invoke virtual or invoke interface. Um, we've taken away, or you no longer have to use invoke special for private methods. You can just use invoke virtual. So it, it simplifies some of the analysis you have to do. But it's one invoke bytecode either way. So the size-wise, it's the same. Does it even work? Hello? Uh, you mentioned that you cannot change the nestmates attribute from yeah. a Java agent, is that right? Yes. Uh, why, why is that? I'm already retransforming the class. Why can't I join? I can change all method behavior and do anything that the class can do. Why so not change that? The reason you can't change that is resolution decisions get cached by the VM. So if you add somebody to a nest, and we've already attempted to resolve the private method, we're not going to know to re-resolve that. Um, that decision's been baked in. Or if you take somebody out of a nest, we're not going to know to go and remove all of the, uh, the previously resolved methods. And so it becomes a bit of a nightmare from a VM perspective to have to go patch everything. Um, you'd take a giant performance hit if we had to do things like that. And so we made the decision to sit, just say that this is not the mechanism for that. Um, if you need to add things to the nest, uh, the, the mechanism to use is whatever we end up coming up with for the dynamic uh, nestmates. But the VM will fail the retransformation then, or will it just ignore the change? Uh, it'll fail. Thanks, everyone.